Welcome biology students. We're going to take a look at evolution, the how and why for evolution, um, <clears throat> taking a look at some pieces of evidence. <clears throat> so ultimately one piece of evidence towards evolution is DNA sequencing. And since the discovery of the DNA molecule in the 1950s, this area of biology has really expanded. A and um, with that ex expansion of knowledge and, and new disciplines within biology, we now use DNA sequencing as the strongest evidence for evolution. And ultimately, when you do DNA sequencing, you're going to compare the DNA bands on chromosomes or use gel electrophoresis and study those gels to see which genes are common among organisms. So it shows an accurate picture of common ancestry. And if you look here, you can see, remember, if you look at a, a chromosome, all those different band, color bands represent the locus of genes. And the gene loci are ultimately where those genes are found on those particular chromosomes. So once we have an idea of uh, where organisms uh, basically have come from, that, that lineage of common ancestry, you can construct a cladogram. And a cladogram is a branching diagram depicting the successive points of species divergence from common ancestral lines. So here you can see uh, a lineage here. So we have uh, lamprey, then jaws become a, a characteristic that's present. So we have sharks there. And then continuing down, now we have the development of lungs. So now we have the salamander and amniotic membrane brings in reptiles. So salamanders are amphibians, lizards are reptiles. Then we have the, the characteristic of hair or the trait of hair. So we're looking at mammals here. So we have tiger, gorilla, no tail, that's going to be a gorilla, and human, bipedal, human, walking on two feet there. That's what bipedal means. So you could see the development uh, or, or the, the ancestry of, in this case, animals um, through this cladogram. Another thing we use is Pangaea, or yeah, not Pangaea, biogeography. And when you look at this map of Pangaea, that's what I was going for, uh, you could see, and you've learned this in eighth grade, earth and space science, but you could see how at one point we had this supercontinent where all the continents were together as one. So biogeography is the study of how and why plants and animals live where they do. And it's going to explain to us why animals and plants have the structures they do, including why they had to adapt certain ways. So uh, one of the things we could see based on fossil records is, is uh, where the continents have once connected. You could see fossils along those coastlines there that match up to support that evidence that supports Pangaea at one point. <clears throat> So ultimately, if we think of this, we could say that camels used to live in North America. They wandered across Pangaea and ended up in the Middle East after Pangaea broke apart. So uh, he here's a picture of where uh, North America was during the times of Pangaea. And you could see uh, that they walked across the continents into the, the Middle East there. And if we look at a map of that, the biogeography of the camel family, we could see their most recent distribution versus their tertiary distribution. So uh, here's their recent distribution and then where they went beyond that point um, as they dispersed throughout all the continents there. Biogeography also can lead to adaptive radiation. We looked at adaptive radiation already. So here we had the, the finch that was uh, basically beaked designed to eat seeds, but from that, due to different roles that these uh, the, uh, finch, the finches played in their environment, they developed a new, uh, well not a new, well yeah, a new beak, um, basically for what they were eating. So we have the buds and fruits beak, we have a beak that's designed for eating grubs, which are like little larvae that, that birds find in trees or in the ground. Um, we have a, a tool using beak uh, for that finch, uh, an insect eating beak on that finch, and a, a beak there for eating leaves. And all of these different uh, species of finches basically uh, came about due to adaptive radiation. And as 
those organisms, their roles changed within their habitat, which is their niche or their niche, um, their, their, their beak over time. Now, remember, this is a gradual change. It takes uh, a lot of time for something like this to happen, but their beak structures changed to meet what they ate. <clears throat> There are also selective pressures, and selective pressures are environmental factors which may reduce reproductive success in a population and thus contribute to evolutionary change or extinction. Um, ultimately, it's going to happen through a process of natural selection. And remember that natural selection is a process whereby organisms uh, become better adapted to their environment and tend to survive and produce more offspring. So when we think of natural selection, we need to think of those two pieces, that one, the organism is better adapted to live within the environment and survive, and two, that the organism is able to produce offspring that are also fertile. Um, examples of selective pressures include things like competition. Um, that's when you have this, uh, two different organisms that are competing for the same thing, whether it be a food source or habitat, etc. Um, predation, um, that's when you have uh, one organism is going to eat another organism. So we call the, uh, the organism that's doing the eating, that's the predator, and ultimately the organism that's going to be eaten will be known as the prey. So if we think of a predator like a red-tailed hawk, that's going to be a bird. Uh, uh, um, there, there will have the, the hawk there and ultimately you would eat the mouse, or it's gonna prey upon that little mouse or, or mice that are running throughout the field. Um, the greater of the pressure, the faster the change. So when you have a lot of, of, of pressures there to, to, uh, on the population, it's going to cause a change in that population to be seen uh, a lot quicker. All right, the other thing there would be genetic drift. Um, genetic drift is the change in the frequency of a gene or a variant, which is allele. So a gene variant is an allele. Remember that those are different forms of a gene in a population due to random sampling of organisms. So ultimately, when we think of genetic drift, this can lead to an improvement of a species genes, making species better as it continues to reproduce and adapt. Um, but genetic drift can also cause extinction of a species. So it could lead to a die-off of that particular organism, depending on which way those gene variants are, are going to um, change and the frequency of those genes within the gene pool for that particular organism. So ultimately, those are, are, are uh, some hows and whys to evolution occur. Um, there's also a little bit of a critical reading that you need to do related to this subject. And I thank you for tuning in. Um, please make sure you filled in any of your notes and have a nice day.